We want to uh, thank you for joining us for our Good Friday service. And um, I really believe, I really, really believe that this is an important service. Because as you focus on what Jesus went through for you, it will make Easter, Resurrection Sunday, all the more glorious. So I want to encourage you to listen to the words that are going to be spoken and the scripture that's going to be read, and the songs that will be sung. And there is meaning and purpose in everything that we're going to say and everything that we're going to do today. And it's all going to be pointing to Jesus Christ and what he went through on Good Friday for you. It's an amazing thing. It's an absolutely amazing thing. So uh, sing with your heart and, and listen, and may the Lord bless you. And may this truly be really the greatest Easter you've ever had because you will have a clearer view of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. So I just want to open our time with a word of prayer and then we're going to get started. Father, we are humbled as we come to this service and we are amazed by what Jesus went through in his demonstration of his love for us. So Lord, I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that we would see the richness of the sacrifice that Jesus went through and what he paid for us. So Lord, do your work in our lives. May we sing, may we listen, uh, may you impact us with the Good Friday story, and we just give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join with us.
Today we will spend the next hour meditating on the last few hours of Christ's life. We're going to follow him from his trial to the tomb. And Before we read our first passage, let me quickly lay the background that led up to this point. Jesus had his last meal, the last supper, with his disciples and then went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. It is from this garden that he is taken by the Jewish leaders and brought first before the former high priest Annas and then the acting high priest Caiaphas and finally the Sanhedrin, a council of 72 Jewish leaders. The Sanhedrin, in response to Jesus' declaration that he is the Christ, declares him guilty of blasphemy. But they do not have the legal right to put him to death So they take him to Pilate, the Roman governor. These events have taken up the whole night, and it is now 6 o'clock in the morning. It is at this point that we begin our reading. In Matthew 27, 11 through 25, we read, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. And so it is that Jesus, the Son of God, is condemned to die. The innocent is condemned so the guilty can go free. God, in his infinite wisdom, uses the evil deeds of man to justify us through the death of his own Son. The evil that was intended was used by God for our good. In Matthew 27, 26, we read these short but poignant words. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Why did Jesus have to be tortured to death? Why couldn't Jesus have a peaceful death? Have you ever considered this question? God's response to sin is never peaceful. The gruesomeness with which Jesus is tortured reveals the severity with which God views our sin. By enduring torture, Jesus experienced the full measure of God's wrath against the guilty. If God recorded our sins, we would be brought to nothing. Christ did not die peacefully in our place because our iniquities demanded that he be wounded and crushed. His body was striped by the flogs so that our bodies may be raised imperishable. Stand and worship.
in John 19, 16 through 17, we read, So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Jesus suffered the weight of our sin in a very physical manner. It is now about 8 o'clock in the morning. After a night of trials and abuse followed by the agony of the flogging, Jesus picked up a heavy cross, the instrument of his impending death, laid it against his tattered skin, and began to drag it out of the city. Jesus carried the instrument of death that should belong to us. We could never bury, uh, bear such a heavy weight. He is always ready to carry it. You only need to hand it over to him. Let's continue our worship with all the deep, deep love of Jesus. Let's stand, please.
In Matthew 27, 32, we read, As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. and They compelled this man to carry his cross. The Almighty God in human form, weak from a night of interrogation and torture, is no longer able to carry his cross. The all-powerful finds himself helpless. He must accept the help from a bystander so he can stumble to his place of death. The one who spoke the world into existence can, cannot find the strength to take another step. God knows your weakness. He understands what it is like to reach the end of your human strength. Are you feeling helpless and hopeless? He has been there, and he is there for you now. In John 19... 23 through 24, we read, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Shame. The one who has no reason for shame finds himself utterly humiliated as they removed his clothing. God, who covered our nakedness in the garden, is now stripped naked by us. The king of kings is treated as a common criminal. If we were stripped to our core, our shame would be laid bare. We may think that God does not know our disgrace, that we can cover up our shame before God. But the truth is that God died to remove your shame. He became shamed so that we could be released from our shame. He knows your humiliation, and he has not abandoned you. In John 19, 18 through 22, we read, There they crucified him, and with, two, with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It is so easy to blame others for the death of Jesus. We can blame Judas or the Jews or Pilate or the Roman soldiers, but it was because of our sin that Jesus went to the cross. Jesus was nailed to the cross by our hands. No one could have nailed Jesus to the cross if he had not chosen to go. The nails that held him there were our sins and Christ's love. Jesus knows your sin and loves you, even to the cross.
In Matthew 27, 39 through 44, we read, And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He has saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. It is now 10 o'clock and the mocking has begun in full force. They think he is weak because he does not resist. Even the criminal next to him mocks him. They use degrading words to mock the very word of God himself. Jesus would have expected such hate-filled words. He taught his followers that he was light come into a dark world. Left in their sin, people love darkness and hate the light. These dark words hurled at the light of the world may have been expected, but the insults only added emotional torment to the physical agony that Jesus was experiencing. Jesus also taught his followers to be salt and light. Identify yourself with Christ is an invitation to be hated by the world. Jesus' followers may have, may have to endure the slings and arrows of hateful words. Let his truth overcome the hatred of others. No matter what people have said or do say about you, God thought you were valuable enough to die for. He loves you, and he can speak comfort into the deep places of your anguish. Please stand and worship with us. Here I am, humbly devoted to you. Here I stand, desperately seeking your truth. of 
John 19, 25 through 27, we read, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. We sometimes forget that Jesus, when he died, experienced the pain of separation. When he was on the cross, he looked down at his mother and realized that he would no longer be present physically to help her. So he chose to place her into the care of his disciple and friend, John. We all experience loss and separation while here on earth. Jesus knows your loss and loneliness, but you are not alone. He is there with you, and he understands. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 45, we read, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Jesus was on the cross from around 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Six hours of pure torture has finally ended. But how can it be that life itself can die? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life has suffered death for us. The greatest mystery of all time is that God would die for man. Yet his death is our life. When we understand that Christ has done for us and accept it by faith, we move from death to life. And when we stand before the Father, we can know that Jesus has been there ahead of us. And he is waiting for us even now. Let's stand, worship. You spoke and worlds were formed. You breathed and life was born. You knew that one day you would come So far from heaven's throne Clothed in human form You showed the world the Father's love You gave, you gave your life away You gave, you gave your life away You gave, you gave your life away Your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debts can pay. You gave, you gave your life away for me. Say 
Matthew 27, 57 through 60, we read, When it was evening, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. As we come to the end of this service, we are reminded that the wages of sin is death. But we have not come to the end of this story, nor are we at the end of your story. There is the gift of eternal life that awaits us. Christ himself is that gift. You may not see him, you may not even feel him, but he is there, working in ways we cannot imagine. He has not forgotten you. Sunday is coming. Stand and sing, be still, my soul.
Amen. And you may be seated. A few, a couple months ago, as you uh, probably know, on the internet, there was this dress. And there was a massive debate that raged that went on. And it, was a, it went viral. And the big question is, is this a white dress or is this a blue dress? And um, if your eyes are good, you, you see it as a blue dress. Um, but some of you see it as a white dress. In reality, we know that that's the dress right there. And the interesting thing is, a lot of people look at the events of Good Friday the very same way. It's kind of like, well, I see white, I see blue, and yet uh, we do that towards what happened on Good Friday and what happened on Easter. But it's not just a preference issue. It's not just a how you look at it because you have a certain eye issue. The way you look at the events of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday is indeed a matter of life and death. It is indeed a matter of heaven and of hell. And so there is no... There is no, um, you look at it your way and I'll look at it my way and we'll all walk away happy. As a church, we have been studying through the book of Galatians and Jesus, before he went to the cross, before he suffered all those things that we looked at today, he said, when I leave, false teachers are going to come in and they're going to deceive you. And that happened. Paul goes and he plants a church throughout the churches throughout the region of Galatia, and before you know it, they're, they're looking at the cross, they're looking at it totally the wrong way. They're looking at it differently, and he had to address it, and he said in, in chapter 1, verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who want to trouble you and distort the gospel. He goes on to say, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. In other words, what was the gospel? The gospel was that Jesus came and he paid for it all. It is finished. It is paid in full. He died and paid the price for your sins, all of it. And you bring nothing to it. And yet there were some that came in and they were saying, yes, what, it, what Jesus did on the cross, it was necessary, but it was not sufficient. And what you have to do to make sure you end up in heaven is you have to, you have to do things. And they were called Judaizers, and they were coming in, and they were saying that you had to be circumcised. Now, that has gone all over the place, and there's people right now who are, who are celebrating Good Friday who are saying that yes, Jesus died on the cross and we thank him for that, but it is not sufficient. You have to do this and do this and do this. And there are certain lists of rules that you have to keep in order to be saved. And what we do is we diminish the cross. The whole point of, of Easter is that Jesus came and he died for you. And for your sins, all of them. And we need to, by faith, turn and surrender our lives. He goes on after, after he opposed Peter because Peter was acting hypocritically. His life was not in line with the truth of the gospel. And in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus' work was sufficient. It's not, it's not what we do. It's not our works. He goes on to say, for by the works of the law shall no one be justified. And justification is the judicial act of God whereby he declares the sinner righteous and treats him as such. And Jesus did that. He paid the price for us. And in the passage that we've been going through in, um, in Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, if in our endeavor to be justified in faith, we too are found to be sinners in Christ, then is Christ a servant of sin? Certainly not. In other words, if you think it's by justification, by faith, and, and then you sin, does, does Jesus promote sin? He said, not at all. He goes on to say, 
For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a, a transgressor. In other words, a person who rebuilds the law, who tries to do it by works after believing in Christ is, is really a lawbreaker. Because guess what? You and I aren't perfect. If it was up to you to work or merit eternal life, we would be doomed, would we not? The, the very thought that if I had to make it through this day without having a critical thought, a critical attitude, be negative about something, and I couldn't make it the day. Every day we sin, every day we indeed fall short. In verse 21, he goes on to say, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Do you get that? In other words, if you think for a moment that you have to earn or merit eternal life, you've, you've missed the gospel. Christ died for nothing. Everything that we've just read and sang and we've looked at the torture that Jesus went through for you and for I, if, if you think that you have to earn or merit that, then, then you don't get it. And Jesus, really, he went through it for nothing. Now, we know that that's not the truth. And we're going we're gonna to celebrate Resurrection Sunday on Sunday. And we're going to go through Galatians 2.20, that I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Our greatest joy is to know that Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. And, and that makes us want to honor him. That makes us want to worship us, worship him. That makes us want to serve him because he has been indeed so very, very good to you. I want to conclude our time together by reading a, a passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that was set before us. In light of what Jesus has done, we do good things, not to earn or merit eternal life, but to bring glory to him. And so we, we put aside the things of the world. He goes on in verse 2 to say, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you get that? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What, what's that joy about? The joy is that you, you could be forgiven by faith alone in Christ alone. He did that because of his great love for us. He goes on to say in verse 3, Hebrews 12, 3, considered him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle Against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus did. Jesus went and he paid it all for you, that you could live for him. The greatest gift we have is Jesus Christ, and it's faith in him alone. It's, it's not by our works that we enter in heaven, but we go forward in faith that we would bring honor and glory to him. That's what it's about. So through this through this Easter weekend, focus on Jesus and what he's done. Rejoice in the salvation that you have. And if you're here and you, and you still think, you know what, I'm going to make it to heaven because I, I go to church. I'm a good person. I do more good than bad. Then please, before you walk out the door, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Jason, because you need to understand that it's not by what you do. It is done, it is finished, it is paid in full. And he, and he did that for you. Surrender your life to him and allow that to be applied to you. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes on him that sent me has eternal life 
will not be condemned, but is crossed over from death into life. My prayer is, is that would be a reality in all of our lives. Let's stand. We'll be dismissing a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder of the gospel. Thank you for the, for the truth that we have in Jesus Christ. That it is truly by faith in him and him alone. That we, we know that our sins are forgiven. And he went to that cross during this time. He was tortured. He did die. He, he did that for us. Lord, may our response be nothing but humble praise and thanksgiving and devotion to you. Lord, may we rejoice in all that Jesus has done for us. Lord, we don't want to sin. We don't want to dishonor you. And so help us as we go towards Resurrection Sunday that we would fully understand all of what it means to be a Christian. So, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the reminder of, of this Good Friday service. And we pray that you would work in our lives. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.